This is the Person of Interest podcast, where we meet extraordinary people with a story to tell. Well, welcome back to the Stockholm School of Economics here in the centre of Riga, and I'm delighted to welcome another smiling guest on the other side of the table. I think she's probably going to lift my mood already. I'll try. Um, <laughs> Olga Kotova is her name. Welcome, Olga. Thank you. And the question I usually start with at the beginning of these uh, discussions is, do you have any connection to the Stockholm School of Economics? Oh, um, I'd like to say yes, but it's a bit of a different type of a connection. Uh, I think I've spent all my childhood partying in Stockholm School of Economics. It kind of so happened that all my peers went to first and second year of this Stockholm school as it mm-hmm. was opening. I think like it was so long time ago, I don't remember first or second, second or third, basically in the very beginning. And uh, by that time, I already was in the second grade of the university. So it was a big question for me whether I have to drop like the normal university mm-hmm. and now go to the Stockholm School of Economics or I shouldn't. And then I, did, I didn't. I kind of thought that time is so precious, I just should go on doing what I'm doing. But that opened a f- sweet opportunity to <laughs> come and party with all, my, with all my friends here at Stockholm School. And we're also playing Doom. Oh, I remember yes. Doom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, in the days when, of the coronavirus when people are supposed to be locked away in their rooms, I mean, <laughs> that's the, that was the first instance, surely. Maybe it's time for a return of Doom. <laughs> yeah, why not? Exactly. Let's just enjoy it. Now, you're an entrepreneur, a businesswoman. You also happen to have a rather demanding and unusual hobby, uh, climbing mm-hmm. large and demanding mountains. I, I never thought of that hobby as demanding, honestly. No. Well, we'll no. get on to that in a moment. No. But maybe first you could just give us a little bit of background about where you're from, mm-hmm. um, your educational mm-hmm. path, and how you came to be I, where I, you are very, today. It's very, it's very simple. It's very straightforward. I'm from here. I was born here. I in Riga. In Riga. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed all my childhood here. All my best friends are from here. So that's like that's very simple. Uh, I am an economist. I'm a master, in sci- uh, master of economics. Uh, uh, I call myself an economist vulgaris, so it's like <laughs> <laughs> the general, yeah. uh, generalist. Um, and I was working in the business on the commercial side since age 16. Uh, yeah, and I still do that. What got you into an interest in economics? I mean, was there uh, an luck. inspiring no, that, that was Yeah, that was like a, a stroke of uh, luck. Or Actually, that, it was not even luck. It was an acute sense of how... Life is short and time is precious. I'm not sure how healthy that was at the age of 14, but that's exactly when I got it. So uh, I clearly remember I was 14 years old when I was talking with one of my best friends and I was like, oh, time is sticking. There's just such a lot of things to do. And she was like, yes, we have to hurry. Mm-hmm. So we hurried uh, and uh, together and I think we landed up our first translation job. Uh, back then and I don't know who was I don't remember who was that fantastic individual who have trust entrusted us uh, trans- to translate uh, documentation for me eight for the helicopter mm-hmm. it's like I had no idea how helicopter functions in any language <laughs> yeah. like in any at all and so this required to... a very precise technical translation yes and i remember <laughs> that and it was uh, the age before google and the age before uh, internet so i remember we were like covered with technical dictionaries from from floor <laughs> to, to the ceiling and we were sitting like all nights and then after we would do uh, a piece of a text i would try to f- find somebody like a pilot uh, whom we would read it to mm-hmm. and try to find out does it make any sense like like and what does that mean exactly? Like how? how and that was, but that was fun. And then right after, I saw uh, uh, an opportunity uh, for an early enroll in the university, and it was a special program. They were kind of trying a new approach. They said you can enroll in university while you are still two years before finishing school, and you can kind of do half of the first year of the university during your school, mm-hmm. and like another half during the next year. So somehow you would kind of finish school and go to the second course already. And that sounded like exactly on my track of life is short and time is precious. And yeah, I've hopped on that. 
and that's and really like interesting it. that even at this sort of quite early age you had this feeling that sort of time is as you say life is short time is precious got to do things now got to fill things up i mean usually that doesn't maybe arrive until a little bit later no, when you feel time probably, pressing on you i should you. probably go to psychotherapy right no, but I, I don't know. But did, can, can you identify kind of where that came? I mean, is it just this conversation with your friend or maybe there was... No, I actually think that there are times to blame hmm. because uh, because that was 91 when I was 14. So so that's independence. That's when suddenly you have like all your horizon hmm. just opens up and you, you, mind-blowing what can you do. And also by the when at the age of 14, you don't, you don't put frames. Like you don't think in terms of, oh, it's unrealistic. Hmm. So it's like now I can go and there's the world and there is nothing I cannot do. And not, and you're always like, I want all of it. Oh, we don't have time. I probably have to start. And you obviously you're very sort of optimistic by nature. It's, it, it seems is it to me. so? Well, yeah, but, but I mean, <laughs> the danger with wanting everything and like wanting to do it. I mean, you're bound to encounter rejection and you know th- some things aren't going to work out. No, but then others will and like... So you just sort of take it in your stride. I don't. I don't think. I don't think that I was like that back then. I'm not so sure, uh, but I don't know when this change kind of happened. I think it's more like you. You just do things, and as you, the more you do, the more experience you have, and the more layers you acquire, and those layering mm. it just. It, it's uh, yeah. It's a source of energy. It's a source of optimism. It's a source of. You just know how things are when they don't work and then you will survive and eventually will go for and forget about mm. it. Well, then, as well as being a, a business developer and a businesswoman yeah. yourself, I noticed you describe yourself as a dream and personal development coach. Now, this got my alarm yeah. bells ringing a little bit. I've got to admit, it, it I'm a little bit cynical about sort of these sort of job descriptions. Mm-hmm. Can you convince me what, you, what exactly is a dream and personal development coach? Well, first of all, dreamer is not a job. Like, it's, <laughs> I, I wish there would be such a job. Uh, maybe futurologist will be that, but mm-hmm. it's a bit different. Now, I, uh, uh, I think that was, I don't know where the description comes from. I think but, it was from your LinkedIn uh, page. Yeah. Uh, I do uh, feel passionate about necessity of dreaming. And what I'm the most concerned about is when you ask a person, what's your dream? And you have like this blank but by dream, do you mean like a dream, like dream, ambition, crazy dream, like I want to be no or imagination? I, mean, I, I, or? I think I uh, by dream I make I think a crazy silly dreams like I want to be I want to go to Mars I want to be I don't know a cosmonaut I want I, don't, I want so to do some something. sort of personal concept some, some sort of personal not entirely achievable but mm. extremely desirable and valuable thing for that individual that would light you up in the morning. Just like thinking that you can do it one day mm. it would light you up. So when you say, you know, you see someone and you just get the blank yeah, so, expression. So like, Mike, what's your dream? To write a really, really good novel. How do you know it's really, really good? But, well, I trust my own judgment. Okay. I've read enough great novels to know one when I see one, is what I would say. Okay, okay. So you see, you, you have that, like, that feeling. And then, yeah. and then, uh, and it doesn't mean that you will go on writing it tomorrow. You probably you probably will actually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, but then it's probably not a, like it's probably like dream going to a plan already. Like uh, dream going to objective already. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I've written yeah. a few, but I yeah. wouldn't say any of them are super good. Super uh, good oh, enough. You're... Good enough. They're not good enough. You're very self-critical. I say they're good, but they're not good enough. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> But uh, that much for uplifting your mood. <laughs> but uh, you're gonna have to work hard yeah, to do that. Yeah. But you see, um, we I believe that like the whole like the act of dreaming, uh, it, it, there is it brings life. It just brings life into people. It brings life into routine, into like every day. It just makes it worth living. Is this then something to do with maybe? keeping that 14 year old self alive yes. into it, it's adulthood about, it's about like don't kill your child mm. in a way because you know what we do have like i and i have small kids now uh, and i observe it every day it's like super fun to observe uh and they are now of this uh incredibly sweet age when they're already old enough in order to like respond to a voice commands and 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 show like 
what's the character, but they're not old enough to lie and misbehave that much. <laughs> right, <yeah. laughs> so I'm enjoying those few months, <laughs> which are really sweet. And then uh, I see they have like immense curiosity. Yeah. It's immeasurable. It's, it's more than the, their curiosity is more than the energy. They would, they would, they could drop dead, mm. tired, but they would still be curious about something, and uh, and of course you can rationalize it. Yes, that's how world made us. They are, they are discovering the world. La la la. That's how we are becoming grown up. But then why do we stop that? And this is something that was bugging me a lot. Like mm. why? What is the moment when we decide deliberately or not deliberately that now we're becoming a serious grown ups and decide what not to ask like, that question? No, all of that. <laughs> that mm. is like. like um, that, those are dreams and those are silly dreams and now I do the serious stuff like mm. I don't know mortgage and that probably kills a lot of dreams uh, but um, yeah so that a little bit bugs me like I don't think we should do that I think we should undo that if that is done mm-hmm. or stop from doing that and encourage our kids not to do that and encourage our parents to kind of remember what they were dreaming of when they were kids mm. and because Putin, like, there are enough of limitations and frames that exist in the world anyway, like legislative, legislative blah, blah, blah. you don't have to put more frames on you yourself and not dreaming. That's exactly that. That's just putting like the, you're putting the tiniest of cage and you just choose to live in, in this caged environment. And like, why would you do that? But this, this creates an interesting question, I think, because, I mean, you have this passion for mm. climbing mountains. Mm. Now, that, I guess you would describe as your kind of dream to some extent. But it's also something which requires a lot of planning, a lot of limits, mm. a lot of very sensible choices. Mm. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not just a sort of romantic return to childhood, mm. is mm. it? So how do you marry these two things up? The, this... Why do you think that dreaming are not sensible? Like, why, why, well, why, why is limit. it in a conflict? Sorry? Why, well, I see the conflict it? between just sort of a complete unbounded free expression and, and climbing a mountain. Well, if you take that approach to climbing a mountain, you're going to die, right? Well, if you can cross the road in the wrong place, you're going to die. Yeah, exactly. You're just, so uh, certain needs, rules needs are pla- required, right? It needs some planning, right? <laughs> yeah. But I mean, that's what I'm saying is... Uh-huh. You're talking about this sort of freedom and Mm -hmm. dreams, but there does have to be some kind of limits imposed if you're going to achieve those dreams, right? But I think, well, first of all, like my my first, I don't know, passion is that just guys dream, like just dream, even if you're not going to achieve them, like start with dreaming dreams. Because in order to want to achieve your dream, it has to be a very qualitative dream. You know, it has to have, have this passion and energy in it a certain that authenticity, would move you mm. and that would move you through difficult times and that would help you open up boundaries and if that dream does not have that energy in it you will just you just never you will never pursue it or you will just stop very very shortly after you've started and it will feel like ah, I, I just have no time but then it wasn't really a dream, was it? Then, it was no, uh, a whim. And, and in order to dream a qualitative dreams, it's like with running or with cooking, you know, with anything. You just have to do that activity and then you will get good at it. Yeah. And, and with Which dreaming, is also discipline. Um, yeah, you can say it that way. You can say it that way. Uh, discipline dreamer. That's an interesting. That's an interesting. I'm not sure how it's semantically it comes makes a together. good title for a book. Though. <laughs> well, you're welcome. Yeah. Don't think. <laughs> but um, so I think uh, dream more. You will you will start if if this concept is foreign to you. Like why would I dream? Just dream very like dream like dream. Dedicate mm-hmm. plan it in your calendar. If this concept is very obvious, it's like, of course, I was dreaming all my life. I went, I take my hat off. Great. Good job. But then eventually you would get better at that. And you would find that thing that moves you. And that may as well be very close to your life purpose. It may, it's maybe not. Mm-hmm. It may change. You know, it may. And uh, 
it's your dream. You have the power to undream it at any given moment. You don't have to explain the world that, oh, I've changed my mind. Yeah, it's I mean, your dream, your mind. You do it what you want with it. Uh, but yeah, I think it's very, very critical to a happy life. Well, you said you're a Riga girl, born and bred. Yeah. Riga and Latvia aren't really known for their mountains. No. Uh, so where no. did this interest in climbing mountains However, come from? However, we have a lot of mountains in the names. Mm -hmm. Like if you look <laughs> geographically on the names, there's yes. basically a mountain in every second town. Yes. And, and so I live on maybe, one actually. Maybe, yeah. maybe that spoke to me. <laughs> <laughs> maybe there is some... But, uh, yeah. Was it a book you read, a film you saw, a story someone told you? I mean, what made you go and... An accident. Yeah. It was an accident. Uh, well, I was I liked the mountains since I first saw them, and I think I was only like I was already eighteen when it happened, so it wasn't like I was able to go to the mountains before. Which mountains so were these? Alps, mm -hmm. but then, even the Soviet Union and stuff. Uh, but I remember Alps. I think I was there. I was seventeen or yeah, around around that time, and they were magnificent, and I was just it was breathtaking. I think I was standing somewhere in like 3,000 meters in Austria and looking around and I thought it's like the most beautiful view I ever seen. And it's almost like the other side of jungle, if it makes sense. Mm. So if you would flip the jungle, you would have the mountains of the other side. And uh, I was quite interested in nature and like animals and all this jungle thing. Uh, when I was a kid so for me that was like the uh, ultimate beauty a jungle from one side and the mountain from the other side and that felt like such a such a connected yet totally opposite universes mm -hmm. so that was mind-blowing I was like totally carried away by that and uh, and I started skiing but that was a different type of going to the mountains I never had a concept that you would have to like I thought somebody have to bring you up and then you can use your power to go down. That kind of was a good thing. But then I never thought I would have to <laughs> use my power to go up. And then uh, way later, it just happened that I got uh, stuck in Reykjavik in February. And in my hotel, they had like a renovation of the gym. And I don't know, I mean, Reykjavik is a fantastic place in the summer. In the winter, in the bad weather, it's not really a lot of things to do apart from eat and go <laughs> to the gym. And if your gym is closed, you get pretty sad very soon. So then uh, in, in the weekend, I decided that I would go up a hill. There was a local hill. You were on your own? Uh, yeah, I went yeah, on my own. Yeah. And I went up the hill and uh, <laughs> and I had rubber boots on my... Uh, uh, like uh, boots with a rubber sole and I think very soon I started to go in a fashion of one step up, three steps down. <laughs> and then I had to kind of slide on my back uh, when, when it was time to return home because I couldn't, like, I couldn't hold, I could, there was no grip. And somehow I was fighting with that heel for like three hours or four. Uh, very many mistakes at many levels, but, but somehow I liked it so much. Like I liked being there. Uh, without anyone, with snow and wind and kind of just talking to that hill and thinking my thoughts and slowly moving up or down. So I kind of like, it was just a blissful experience. Mm. Like, bl like pure, it was pure bliss. I mean, some people sometimes talk about going a place and feeling immediately at home there or feeling yeah. like they belong there even though they've never been mm -hmm. there or have no connection. Is it, is it that sort of thing or... I mean, you also talked about fighting against. Yeah, it, the it was not. E it was like not easy. Mm. It wasn't like uh, you know, like when you dive, when you're underwater, uh, th there is, uh, uh, especially when you go a little bit deeper, when the colors fade, then you can catch this uh, moment of total. Uh, you're weightless, so you kind of like float, mm -hmm. and that's the more. That's more of that. That's more like when you when you're in that floating condition then you feel almost like maybe I was born there or maybe like I belong to this. Because it, it's not difficult. There is no technicality. You just, you, just, you just are your senses. In the mountains, it's different for me. 
because it's quite physical. But then again, when it's physical, my brain work better. If but it's interesting sense. this idea of talking to the the hill or the mountain as yeah. well. I mean, that's yeah, I kind of like I, I kind of communicate with I don't know with with what I see around in my head. I so your your brain's kind of operating in a different way than yeah, it does usually. Definitely, definitely, mm. and it's and I like that way, and I just really and I can't make my brain to operate in that manner in Riga, mm. unfortunately. Uh, so this was your first little expedition. It was, it was like a aha moment. It was yeah. like oh I I I screwed this. I, it was just a disaster. Well, I it didn't even qualify for good hiking, like right. what I've done there. So it was terrible Te on, from the technical perspective. I just loved it emotionally. And, and I thought, but if I really, really love it, the only thing that I have to change are my boots and then I have to go back. <laughs> and that's exactly what I've done in a week. <laughs> you, so changed, within a week you I've went back. I've changed my boot. I've changed my boot, and yeah. then and then by that time uh, uh, I was together with uh, uh, a guy who would become my husband, and uh, uh, and we thought we uh, went together on the same on the same hill, hill. Mm -hmm. uh, and with the better boots we made it uh, uh, to the top of the hill. It was like a one kilometer hill. It's really like not a mountain, with a bit of scrambling on top. So it's like hiking with a bit of scrambling. Uh, and we got on top together and it was a really nice, like, I don't know, four hours walk. And we came back and we thought, you know, we need to do more of that. Uh, so we went uh, to Juana del Schnikur, which is the uh, highest volcano in Iceland. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in a couple of weeks time, we have uh, Googled up, uh, <laughs> someone's there. Don't like, guys, whoever <laughs> listened to me now, Please don't do it at home. Don't repeat it. It's not safe. <sighs> Disclaimer: We've googled up uh, how to uh, do the rope work <laughs> <laughs> and how to behave behave on the glacier because right. there are crevasses and stuff. So the kind of we thought that that is it. We made a list of things that we don't know what how to do and that are dangerous. And you had no previous training no. in this at all. No. But we sit down and we said, let's employ our common, like our logical thinking. Let's make a list of what can go wrong and see what uh, preemptive measures we can take to kind of mitigate. Mm -hmm. And so we sit down and we try to make a list so the weather can go wrong. And then uh, there could be too deep snow or there could be ice or there could be a glacier, which we don't know how to navigate, but we have heard that their rope work involves and some rescuing. So, and then maybe we need, so we, we made this list and then we tried to see how to deal what kind of equipment we would need to kind of meet the problem and what kind of skills, like technical skills we would need. So it's okay, we probably need to learn how to walk on crampons. And first we need to learn how to fix a crampon in the right way, because there are many, many ways how you can fix a crampon in a totally wrong way. Mm -hmm. So, uh, small pieces, like small, small bits. So then we would fix a crampon, I would train on that. And I will see again on the YouTube, what's the right way, what's the wrong way, what's the difference. Try it in a different way ourselves. Okay, so we got it. Well, you didn't even like ask the guy in the crampon shop what you should do. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. I, I have uh, received those crampons as a gift of sorts. Because that was the moment I, I had the um, uh, opportunity to fly to Riga and back. Uh, I need uh, for some meetings, and then I met a, a, a guy who was a prof was professional uh, mountain climber here, and I told him what I want to do. Okay. And then he looked at me and he said, "You would need crampons." I said, "I know I would need crampons." He said, "Are you ready to buy crampons?" I said, "No, because they're different kind of crampons. I have no idea what I need to buy." And he was like, "You know what? Wait. I have some pair, a couple of pairs in the attic that are like I definitely don't need anymore. Just." use them <laughs> that's, that, that's how we got our crampons <laughs> and so then you did this big a proper big mountain this was your first that one. was like that was not it still doesn't qualify it mm. is a big mountain it's like two kilometers mountain but i think it's like about 14 to 20 kilometers like the mm. trip so it's like a full a proper 12 to 18 hour day that would, would have some glaciers and some snow and ice and 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 all of that I'm interested to ask. And we did that... it in February, which was not a very oh. <laughs> obvious, <Yeah. laughs> obvious time of the year. <laughs> With that first walk up the hill that yeah. you described in your rubber boots yeah. and you know yeah. no experience, 
Do you think you would have gone back and done it again if you'd succeeded the first time? Was the fact that you didn't make it important? No, I, no? I was not planning to make it. Okay. Like uh, when I when I started, uh, I was like my objective was I I need to have some movement because my gym was closed. Mm. But I cannot just uh, make myself walk on the main street of Reykjavik like ten blocks each direction. It's just not pleasurable in February, especially. So it wasn't a case of you thinking, yeah, I'm gonna. No, I was like, I needed hill. maybe five uh, hours of uh, movement that I would enjoy. Mm. Oh, there is a hill. Why don't we go up the hill then? And so, how did this develop then? I mean, it sounds like quite quickly you knew that this was the thing for you. But it was almost like we were, I don't know, it's like uh, like when eating the ice cream, you have a first bite. You kind of quickly know it's for you, right? Yeah. It, 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 the idea that why don't I put it uh, aside and... Uh, but then that's usually, <laughs> that's usually accompanied by a sort of slight feeling of surprise that it wasn't part of your life before. You yes, know, like, that, that's exactly how it was like, hmm. why, how come I'm like almost 30 and I'm only now discovering that I'm loving going up the mountain on my own foot like h- how it's even the case and is it still the same pleasure you get from it now or has yes, it changed no i, I mean it's same or more hmm. it's just I, I it's just an amazing place mountains so it's about and, being and i there. like and i like lo- yeah it's about being there uh, and I, uh, for me like even just hiking doesn't have to be like a very technical mountain with a big name uh, just a simple hiking, it still cuts it for me. Like, mm. I, I, I start to receive pleasure right away. And what's been your favorite climb, then? Is there one that particularly sticks out? Alaska. Alaska. Why was that? Um, it's, uh, first of all, it's, such an, it's so beautiful. Like, there are almost no words. I'm not a professional writer. There are almost no words how to describe the beauty that you are immersed in 24 7 for a month and it's all the time it's it, like you you cannot even step out of that beauty like mm. you're you're swimming in that it's so intense you almost getting tired and and the moment when you think that you are not you cannot get surprised anymore by the other look of the sky or the other then you you, you get out you stick your uh, head out of your tent and you get surprised like every time and uh, in Alaska, it's also, it's so north that it's quite uh, light during the night and the summertime. So you actually, it, this is the only expedition when you don't need a torch. Like you don't have a headlamp, you don't have a, any, you don't need it. Mm. And you can just walk any time of the day. And there are part of expeditions when walking at night makes a particular sense because you're walking on a very fragile surface. So you actually need those extra degrees of, of uh, chill. And uh, um, yeah, what what you see, how you see those landscapes, and, and and during the daylight, and during the night, and with the moon, and with the stars, and without, and with this, with the storms, and storms can get ferocious there. Like this is completely horizontal wind, which which you you have to dig in your tent in two meters of snow, and basically pray for <laughs> for it to blow over, literally. Yeah, and. Uh, and it's still so incredibly beautiful. And you kind of, it, it, it's, you don't feel intimidated by it. You feel like a part of it. You don't feel intimidated, but there obviously is an element of danger involved in a, well, in any no, mountain but, but you have, what you do feel, what you do feel, you feel like a respect. Like you feel a mm-hmm. respect uh, to the universe and the elements. And that's why I particularly hate the the word conquer the mountains mm-hmm. i think this is such an absurd it's like the ultimate absurd it does not exist you, you if you think you have conquered the mountain i mean don't think it or don't conquer the next mountain you will you will die one day mm. yeah that's not the healthy activity well i'm glad to hear you say this because yeah. when i saw that you kind of use this in your coaching uh, yeah. uh, and and sort of uh, advice to businesses and so on yeah. as well i mean it's a very old cliche this whole idea of yeah mountain climb your business is just like mountain climbing we've got to reach the goal i mean it's the big it's the have i used that no no what i'm saying is yeah. you're saying what you're yeah. saying is the opposite yeah. i mean what you usually hear is this yeah. stuff about you conquer the mountain you know no, you don't yeah you, you just don't you can conquer yourself maybe yeah if you're super lucky but then how do you extend this into the uh kind of business uh, advisory role if you're not using that you know 
tired old metaphor of the mountain that way. How are you using it? You know, I first of all, I don't do this kind of copy paste from the mountains. Mm. I mean, I don't think that you have to. Uh, of course, mountaineering for me, it's like a personal, it's a very personal path. Uh, for many expeditions, I was never telling people I would go there or like on a few of them would know. So it's, so it's a very intimate process. And it's an intimate process that teaches me something. It does not necessarily have to teach the universe the same thing it maybe mm. doesn't work for you or like you would not derive the same conclusions or or even better you would derive the same conclusions not going out of the library you don't really need to go up the mountain you know clever people probably can reach way deeper conclusions just on the meditation mat i'm just not equipped with that degree of uh, of patience or, or or cleverness uh and uh, um so for me, mountain is just the source of good thoughts. And those good thoughts are something which are applicable to personal life or to business, not necessarily mountains mm. itself. So it's the insight. It's, yeah. it's not, you're not just using the mountain as a way of talking about business. It's a, No, like, it's and I usually thing. don't mix mm. the two. Uh, I don't think they are. Well, you did this TED TEDx talk yeah, about yeah. this subject, didn't you? You don't know what they're talking about. Uh, well, no, but again, on your LinkedIn page, it was t talking about the uh, the mountains it? and business together. No. Okay. One more question that I've been asked mm -hmm. to ask you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a good start. By a woman. <laughs> That's a good start. To That's a good start. You have children, uh, and so how do you? I mean, how do you? Reconcile is the wrong word, but how do you take into account the fact that there is an element of danger when you're mm -hmm. doing a sort of hardcore ex mm -hmm. expedition like mm -hmm. you, you mm -hmm. um, describe digging in your tent and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff? I mean, tent mm -hmm. blows away, hypothermia mm -hmm. could be quite a bad situation. Mm -hmm. So what's the attitude you take with regard to your children, family and so on? And I would have asked this to a man as well. <laughs> So it, you just preempt if I, yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, yeah, that's, that's uh, um, a good, a good, um, good preemption. Um, first of all, I don't think with kids or without kids, like when you go up the mountains or you do any other activity, uh, it's not like you plan to die. Like you don't work, you don't, you don't do it f with negligence. You don't go like, oh, I don't have kids, so I may just die tomorrow. I mean, that's not at least how I have approached it before kids. So uh, I think uh, you kind of prudent all the time with or without kids. Kids do add an additional degree of responsibility and you're probably, you're, you're, you, get, you get more cautious. Mm -hmm. So I I'm probably are uh, comfortable with... Uh, lower degrees of risks than I used to be before, but they would be a bit lower. Of course, uh, all the time, and me and my husband, like and we do, when we do some of the activities together, we would uh, kind of discuss what we are comfortable with and what we're not comfortable with and what are the plan B and C and so on. And there is one um, ultimate uh, recipe that works for me with or without kids and this have not changed and i don't think this will change but this is something which for me is the ultimate recipe from a disaster uh, and that is dissociate with your objectives i'm not Shall sure I I elaborate I, yeah please um again maybe it was different for like uh, every individual is unique i unfortunately I wasn't born with that concept. I wish I would kind of learn it at school. That would be way, life life would be way easier. But somehow at school or before, I thought that you are what you do. Like you are your dream. You are your objective. You are the result of your actions, whether you succeed or whether you fail. So you're either success or kind of failure. Mm. And then you learn, you know, I mean, you know that, oh, you shouldn't feel as a failure if you don't succeed or you can try again. So you kind of read about it, but you don't have that deep in, inside. 
So you still feel that you are what you do. And that's the approach to objectives that you have. And that's why objectives are really, really tightly connected with your ego. You kind of cannot disassemble it, like you cannot put it into different containers. It, they, it, it's all solidified. And that is very dangerous because that is the moment when your reason is not there for you in mm -hmm. full capacity. And that's the moment when your ego can override your reason very, very easily. And that's what happens in business. And that's what happens on the mountains. And that's probably the first time when I'm comparing business <laughs> and the mountains. Uh, so you need an ability to You need an ability maintain to maintain some distance. To, yeah, to step out and to look on this as an activity, as a process. And you look, need to understand that you like you hopefully will have a long life. And you have many different stages and you do uh, many like there are processes and you have mm. several roles. And it's the combination of all that that makes you you. Not anything in the particular, not now, not tomorrow, not this role, not because you're a mother, not because you're a journalist, not because you're a mountain climbing. That's all important facets, but they are one, like they're facets of something which has unmeasurable amounts of facets and you don't even know how many facets you have until mm. you have kind of finished your life. And so, and you, if you can dissociate from a particular facet or one objective which is laying on the surface of that facet, then you're kind of like, okay, but if it doesn't work, I'm cool mm. with that. And then you don't, you, you, then there is, you're not taking risks or you're more prudent or you're more relaxed and you're more chill. So it doesn't have to enjoy, be an all or nothing. Yeah, and you enjoy yeah. this process. And then it's like, oh, but the mountain will be there. Or like, mm -hmm. okay, I, I've, I've uh, failed with this project. Like I really, I made losses. I, I probably, uh, either I will learn or I will not learn. <laughs> it does not really define whether I am as a entrepreneur and it definitely doesn't define where am I as a, as a person and as an individual. And that for me is a very, very fundamentally important approach to everything. And uh, yeah, and when there are kids in the picture, you just kind of more do more of that and everything will be fine. Well, that seems to make a lot of sense. We're nearly out of time, mm -hmm. but before we go, I'd just like to ask you one final question, Olga. So what are you dreaming of at the moment? <gasps> I, how, may, how, much, how much time <laughs> do I have? <laughs> um, my next crazy thing on agenda, and I don't know if it will ever happen. I want to circumnavigate the globe with uh, my husband and kids. In, in what form? I mean, uh, in a balloon? In no, a submarine? Uh, no, uh, a sailing boat. Oh. Under sail. Okay. Under sails. Any sort of uh, time frame? Maybe uh, two, three years, two or three years from now. Well, we'll see. I don't know. I don't I, know. We'll see. We'll I try. hope your dream comes true. I do hope that. And thank you very much for talking with me Thanks, today. Thanks, Mike. Cheers. Thank you for listening. This podcast was produced by SSC Riga. If you'd like to learn more about the topic, visit the open course schedule at SSC Riga Executive Education. For more podcasts, find us on Spotify, iTunes, or the platform of your choice. Remember, share this episode with your friends and colleagues.